Hello, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Matt Scott, the Director of Storytelling and Engagement at Project Drawdown, and this is Schools for Climate Education, Teaching and Learning for Drawdown, part of the um, Drawdown Eco Challenge, which is a great way for people to be engaged with climate solutions, but um, one of many ways to get engaged with climate solutions, climate education on campuses. And so I'm so thrilled for us to hear from a number of folks today as we go along. You're seeing their, their images on on the screen uh, right now, but I actually want to invite everyone, um, all of the participants, because uh, we'll give them a chance to introduce them in a second, to uh, share their video because um, we're gonna we're gonna give um, Amoy, Erica, Laura, Sarah, and Steve a chance to introduce themselves. But again, this is part of the Drawdown Eco Challenge, which you could learn more about drawdown.ecochallenge.org. You could sign up individually or with a team if you want to participate in the eco challenge and discover climate solutions and climate actions incredibly friendly for students for schools for communities but i will stop sharing and again want to invite uh steve erica laura amoy sarah on uh as we get ready to introduce each and every one of them and let's just dive in because i've been talking enough so far and it's time that we hear from you. Um, but first and foremost, I want to invite the one and only uh, Amoy Walker, experiential learning specialist at the Galloway School. Learn more about the Galloway School at GallowaySchool.org um, to to share and actually answer our first question, which is yeah. who are who are you? And like in short, why do you do the work that you do, Amoy? So as Matt mentioned, my name is Amoy Walker and I'm the Experiential Learning Specialist here at the Galloway School. We're a small independent day school in Atlanta. And my role is to help teachers and be a co-laborer in learning by doing. So a teacher brings an idea to me and then we workshop it together because teaching can be sometimes isolating. And so my role on campus is to be that co-laborer, that co-partner with teachers to like make sure that the students are getting a really enriching inquiry-based, project-based learning experience here at the Galloway School. And I love doing this work because, you know, this impacts us in our daily lives. Um, and for us in Atlanta, flooding is a big issue for us. And so it's just like looking at the real world ways that climate impacts our lives here in our city. That's powerful. And even just the term co-laborer, like is so... Um, powerful. And I think it's a good reminder of like the power of students, the power of young people that um, it's not just a one way interaction of sharing information, but it's really a collaboration too, which is powerful. And kind of moving through the um, moving up, I'd say in terms of the different grade levels, I want to introduce the one and only, or really invite the one and only Sarah Duffer, Earth and Environmental Teacher at Asheville High School um, to introduce herself. And I'll drop the link to Asheville High School in the chat. But again, who are you and why is it that you do the work that you do in short, Sarah? <sighs> My name is Sarah Duffer. I'm a veteran educator at Asheville High School in, in the beautiful mountains of uh, Western North Carolina. And I've been teaching earth and environmental science on three levels, standard, honors, and advanced placement for almost 20 years. Drawdown changed my life. I was given a copy of the book by a student. And and um, once I realized what it was and the potential it brings and the inspiration it brings, it changed my life both personally and professionally. And then when I got the email about the Drawdown Eco Challenge in the spring of 2018, I thought, oh, finally, this is a way for me to really actively engage the Drawdown Solutions with my students. And so we just dove into it. And we were the winners of that first inaugural Drawdown Eco Challenge. Um, and it was a whirlwind story. I won't get into it now, um, but I will say that I think we're all craving solutions and to know concrete actions that we can take uh, to be part of the solution. And that is why I love Drawdown and especially the Drawdown Eco Challenge. Thank you for having me. Wow, what an honor. Uh, and yeah, it's always awesome to hear when people are utilizing Project Drawdown, Drawdown resources, but I want to shift over to someone who is less than 100 miles away from you, also in North Carolina, 
Um, Lauren, Laura Aaron England, who is, among many other things, practitioner in residence with the Department of Sustainable Development at Appalachian State University. Please share who you are um, and uh, just your story in short of why you do the work that you do, Laura. Thank you, Matt. It's really an honor to be here. I am a huge fan, like Sarah, of Project Drawdown. So we'll always say yes to anything related to Project Drawdown's work. And it's an honor to be in conversation with all of these amazing educators today. So as Matt said, I teach in the Department of Sustainable Development at Appalachian State University, um, where I've been for 14 years. This academic year, half of my position now is dedicated to a campus-wide climate literacy initiative that um, I'm sure I'll get a chance to talk about a little bit more later. In terms of um, why I do the work that I do, I'm, I'm a bit unusual as a faculty member in that I came to the classroom via first the nonprofit sector where I worked as an outreach professional. And sort of the thread that I've pulled through all along is just my love of talking with people about the natural world and our relationship with it and how we can improve on that. Um, so as an ecologist, my background and training is environmental science and ecology. Um, I can't help but be you know, deeply concerned about what climate change means for communities of life all around the world. Um, I'm also a parent of, of two wonderful kids and um, I want to do all that I can to ensure that um, the world they grow into and the world that all of today's kids are growing into is one that is safe and healthy and full of possibilities for them. Um, and then as an educator, I just I feel this obligation to help our students um, prepare to navigate climate disruption and also um, be prepared to participate in all the transformations that are needed to secure a safe and, and just climate future. So lots of reasons that um, ultimately just boil down to my love for the world and all of the beautiful life and lives that make it up. Wow, thank you, Laura. And it's it's beautiful to hear that. And I think it, it fits really well that we're going to transition to Erica Cochran Hameen, who is on. And Erica, look, I know I'm going to mess up <laughs> one of your many titles, but um, other than just being, of course, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion within the School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon University, you're an assistant professor, you're co director of the Center for Building Performance and Diagnostics, uh, the track chair, do, like, do, uh, you're doing, you do all, you do it all. Um, again, Educators are superheroes, and one of the things that I really appreciate about all of you. Um, but I just want to invite you, Erica, to introduce yourself, share who you are, and again, why you do the work that you do. Sure. Thank, thank you so much, Matt, and thank you to my fellow panelists. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. And you know, like everyone else, if Matt's asked something, I'm going to say yes because Matt is just so awesome. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon and I do what I do because I, I love architecture. I always wanted to build. When I was a little kid, I was building with Legos, like the typical architecture story. And then I went into academia and it's an absolute pleasure for me to help share my knowledge and train the next generation of architects. And as I do that, I think about something my, one of my sons said to me. Whenever he does something, he says, mommy, is that building hurting the earth? He's, he asked that question. And I, and I said, no, well, remember, mommy's job mm -hmm. is to help buildings not hurt the earth. Because he's always asking, when I do this, am I hurting the earth or am I making the earth happy? And so I do what I do because, like Laura, I want my two children to have a future and for their children and children and, and mm -hmm. great, great, great grands to have a, 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 a planet. But I just want us all to be able to breathe. I want us all to have happy places that we can live and learn and work and play and do it while being healthy, while being productive, and to work together with, with amazing, talented, smart people so that we can help our future and do things so that we don't hurt the earth. Wow. Thank you so much um, and for being here and for uh, responding to my calls or my call, so to speak, for this. Uh, but also, um, I, I have to mentioned that not only Erica are you someone who I met who we met at Project Drawdown through our Drawdown's Neighborhood Initiative a climate solution short documentary series which I will I'll drop the link to Drawdown's Neighbor in the chat here drawdown.org slash neighborhood but also 
that um, our last panelist who we want to introduce, last but not least, of course, there's no least here. I'm Maybe I'm the least, um, but it's Steve Place who is joining us. And Steve, um, well, we met Steve um, in his role exclusively with the Candida Building, uh, uh, Candida Building for Innovative Sustainable Design, uh, but also Steve is the uh, Campus Sustainability Project Manager at uh, Georgia Tech. And so Steve, uh, do you just want to introduce yourself and why you do the work you do? Sure. Uh, so I, uh, I'm at heart a gardener and I love having, being in the dirt and getting dirty and, and, and creating things. Uh, I work alongside uh, the educators here and my, my role is a little different in the sense that I work a lot with students, but it's, it's more hands-on stuff that like, things that they've perhaps not done. Uh, we do ivy pulls here on campus. We have community gardens uh, and, uh, you know, we're actively pursuing bird watching, uh, all kinds of things that perhaps are a little outside of the uh, normal lives of these highly technical uh, students. Uh, you know, they're very theoretical and they're, they're very much uh, often in the classroom, but to get them outside and to working with their hands and, to, and trying uh, some experimental stuff and, and knowing that, you know, the, the garden creates a, uh, an environment that's free of judgment and in fact encourages uh, that exploration and, uh, uh, curiosity. So, you know, me, I, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm, I'm surrounded by awesome students. I get to do awesome work and uh, I'm always learning. So, I mean, you know, what could be better? Wow. That's powerful. And I like that you start to kind of touch on some of the work that you do. Um, and it kind of brings me to a, a question that I want to kind of pose for, for all of you. Um, Steve, you started to talk a bit about some of like those experiential components of climate solutions and how you're integrating that um, with students and their learning. Um, also, I will say that in your Drawdowns Neighborhood interview, I think you do such a beautiful job of just talking about like the mental health benefits and other benefits that are a little bit less tangible than what we might think about when we think of climate solutions or gardening and the like. But I want to put out the question, maybe starting with Amoy. I'm putting you on the spot, but, but why is you're ready for it? Why is academia? Why would you say that like academia is an important part of climate solutions? Like I, I, I can imagine many people don't often think of educators when they yes. think of climate and climate solutions. Um, I do now because I'm exposed to so many of you and your wonderful you know, stories. But like, yeah, I'd love like to learn more. Like Steve that. mentioned that yeah. he's gardener, and mm -hmm. that's the core of who he is. And here at the Galloway School. We use gardening as a tool for early learners, like three-year-olds, four-year-olds, as a way to engage with the land. And what does that mean? And that is an entry for everyone. And I teach a social innovation class here, and we're learning about food insecurity in a neighborhood called Browns Mill that has the largest mm. food forest in the country. And those students were able to partner with the early learning students to do some gardening. And we learned from that experience that community gardens are amazing places for collaboration, for sharing information, for just being a source for any neighborhood like Browns Mill, where people could come together and talk about what's going on in their neighborhood. And some of the things that may be happening in their neighborhood are relating to related to climate. And so, Really, if we didn't have an experiential learning program here at the Galloway School, we wouldn't open the doors for those natural moments to happen when my seniors can teach some fourth graders or some third graders about gardening and the importance of that work. And Steve is clearly doing it over at Georgia Tech with his you know, older kids. So I think gardening is an entry even into climate solutions. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm I'm curious again how this how this question of like what is the role or why does the role of educators matter when it comes to climate solutions? Whether from obviously there's the education aspect, but there's also like the actual solutions. Just Laura, Sarah, Eric, Laura, if you want to jump in. 
Yeah, sure. Well, I, I mean, I think one important reason is students want to learn about climate solutions. So we as educators, mm. you know, um, we should be responsive to that. Uh, and, and the world needs climate educated professionals, right? Like Project Drawdown um, has this amazing library of climate solutions. We have all the existing solutions that we need and we need broad implementation of them across you know, all sectors of the economy. And we can't do that without professionals across all sectors of the economy who are prepared to do the work. So, you know, both from the standpoint of you know, it's what the youth want and deserve and mm. it's what the world needs as well. Um, I think education has a critical role to play across all levels. And it's really fun to have educators who are working with students across all the ages in this in this room, in this conversation. Yeah, and I, I see it. I, I just like saw Sarah nodding um, to that so much, but I'm also just thinking, Sarah, about the ways that you have like utilized eco challenge in that process. And so beyond like just the importance of, um, you know, academia and climate solutions and the bridge there, um, I just kind of want to invite you to talk about what that's or to start to talk about really like what that um, bridge has looked like in your uh, in your community, in your education. Well, schools are microcosms of the greater community, and there's not many places where one individual has access to, like my ninth grade honors classes have 28 students in both of my sections. Um, and so that's a lot of potential to talk about climate solutions. And my hope is that then they go home and they have those dinner table discussions. Um, you know, what's for dinner this week, mom, dad, Tia? Um, and how can we maybe eat less meat, eat more vegetables? Um, maybe instead of going grocery shopping right now, we can take 10 minutes and take a look in the fridge and the freezer and see what we have. Do we really need to go grocery shopping? How can we reduce our food waste, right? Um, and I, I absolutely agree. There was somebody in the chat that said, and I think Laura too said, that students are hungry for solutions. Our media does a really excellent job with communicating all of the really hard climate news. And we're all just really craving to know those solutions. So when it comes to the eco challenge, um, I have my students um, do a month long uh essentially their own self-study where they choose daily eco challenges as many as they want and then they track their progress on the eco challenge platform they take pictures of their progress so if they've if they're reducing their food waste then they may take pictures of food waste or what they've composted or a clean plate um and then in the classroom, we focus on one-time solutions, and those are mostly researching. So I have 14 lessons that um, I created over time, and I'm happy to share those with folks. Um, I'll put my email in the chat, and you can reach out to me. Um, and, and that's when it's like, okay, lockstep, we're going to learn about, like, Monday, we learned about refrigerants because mm -hmm. um, there was some news about the ozone layer hole um, last week in the current event. So I thought it really dovetailed nicely. And then um, late last week, we talked about wind turbines, micro wind turbines. So, um, you know, we were just kind of all over the place in the month of um, October. Sometimes it dovetails nicely. Sometimes it's just kind of a random climate lesson. Um, I have started to dedicate in the past uh, three years, Fridays for the Future, um, inspired by Greta. And so every Friday, no matter what unit we're studying, we just pause and we focus on climate solutions. So we talk about climate science, um, the economics of climate policy too, so that they can gain some literacy there. And then also, of course, climate solutions. Did I answer your question? Oh, you answered my question. And it, 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 it sets me up well to pivot to Erica, actually, because Erica, when I think of, I mean, I'm sure you already have like thoughts on this topic, but one thing I really appreciate, um, and, and I'll credit you for this, like with me is like, I just appreciate the value of questions so much because you're someone who I've seen 
asking the questions to find solutions or ask like, why are the schools the way they are when it comes to buildings and their efficiency and the quality? And how does that impact students? And how, like, there's so much there, but I just want to kind of give you the space to, well, one in general, talk about whatever you want, but also uh, (laughs) to talk about this topic of like why it matters and also um, just like, what does it look like from your perspective? Because you're not just like, while climate is a, big part of what you do um there's also equity there's also there are so many other aspects that I know you bring in exactly thank you so much Matt you know so one of the like the big overarching things with buildings is just looking at like what affects climate change what where greenhouse gases coming from are those emissions and so when you look at who our largest energy hog is it's building so if you compare Mm -hmm. buildings with transportation and industry Buildings are using more energy than transportation or energy. So it's the largest sector. And it's also the sector where we spend 90 to 95% of our time. So you think about it, you're spending 90 to 95% of your time in a building. And shouldn't that building be a place that's healthy? Where you and I talk about being able to breathe. And, and that mm. stems in with some a lot of the, the equity work I do because they go together. Because when you think about people from disadvantaged or disenfranchised, demographics. Sometimes they're in neighborhoods that don't have access to clean air. They're next to the highways. They're in buildings with windows that don't open or old um, heating and cooling systems where the ventilation system is just subpar. And so you look at those conditions. And so not only are they using a ton of energy, but then you have people who are already disadvantaged, disenfranchised, in situations where they're literally in spaces that are making them sicker already, giving them even more um, pre-existing health conditions, hurting themselves so that they have these pre-existing health conditions. And so a lot of the work I do is, is twofold. It's working with higher education and working with undergrads and grads to understand how quality building should be for everyone, not just for people, not just for rich people, not just for the Western world, but everyone on this planet deserves to have a good place to live. And to ask them, is this going to help people? You know, buildings last 50, 100 years, hundreds of years. When you're gone, is that building that you've put people in helping them? And do they feel happy about this place that they're in? And one of the fun things that I do, which really I, I, I just find super exciting, is I work with my students and we go and do energy and environmental assessments of public buildings. So going into like inner city classrooms and going to places where they maybe can't afford to have a ton of engineers or architects running around and doing all the scientific um, investigations. Mm. My students are doing it and they're providing these reports to them for free. And so then students are seeing how the work they can do in college can actually help someone and make a difference directly. And then there's even another benefit, which is that the kids in those schools are seeing people who are not just a little bit older than them helping out. And it's making them say, whoa, I could go to college. I could be an architect. I could be an Mm -hmm. engineer. I could do that. And so just those levels, um, I think that just helps with equity in terms of age, in terms of um, sex, in terms of nationality, demographics, all things together, just keeping all of those things and working with the K through 12 and the higher education and saying, how can we all work together so that we can provide better quality buildings so we can live and sleep and breathe fresh air? Oh my gosh, that was electrifying. Um, <laughs> but I will also say, uh, no no climate solutions, pun intended there actually, but it was, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it makes me really think about just the fact that um, even to the point of what you mentioned, Erica, and what we've kind of touched on that students and young people do have power not just to learn and be recipients of information and knowledge or to even work on small projects but like to actually make an impact with the contributions and what you said Eric actually made me think of when I was in in school but especially when I was in college and one of the best things that I had was just being involved in these different student organizations where I learned through these experiences of like also adding value and also making an impact in the community. But, you know, this actually, all of this brings me in a different direction, um, which like, if there's a script, this is a little off script because I think about two groups. Like I think about students and just how do we go about 
engaging students who obvious like I'll say for me personally like I was someone who if we you started a conversation like with climate solutions or with emissions and data like my head would just start spinning and I know that a lot of us are like that so um, I am curious from folks um, if anyone wants to kind of jump in and then start to answer that question but we talked about some of the experiential components especially just with Amoy and Steve and and even Erica and your examples but I am so curious how do you get through to students who um just wouldn't really resonate with the science data approach to talking about climate I I, I, I can oh, Erica yeah oh, go, for, go I see all oh, everyone's coming off of mute, like, by the way to jump in so maybe Erica oh, and then like Laura and then Sarah and yeah. um one of the things I do, and Matt, you touched on this, is this whole learning by doing. I mm. think you have to combine book learning with like experiential learning. And experiential learning, when you put that in, that's the thing that they remember. And so when we go in with all our scientific ex equipment, we also have to make it in a way so that they can understand it. And so like we'll have a carbon monoxide detector. And the best way for people to understand um, carbon dioxide is to give it to someone and say, okay, we're gonna measure carbon dioxide. And if you hand it to a student and say like, go over there and like, just breathe heavy real quick <laughs> on mm. that. And then they see the sensor move. And now they're like, whoa, now you can explain. Guess what? We exhale, you know, carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen, that tree is doing the verse. We need that tree. You can say it one way, but if a student goes and like breathes on the sensor and they see the sensor move, now they get it. When you, then we say, okay, here's the light meter. And they go over and you stand under a light and then you go into a dark shadow and they see that change. It means something. So I love to just let the students hold the sensors and loan it to them and give them a chance to run around their buildings, run around the school and see the different spaces. So then they'll run to the science room, they'll run to the gym, they'll go to the pool and they'll say like, whoa, you know what? The gym... TVOC levels were high. What's going on? It's like, well, what are the cleaning products that they're using? Mm. And then, you know, that's even led some school groups to demand different cleaning products because they saw that spike go up. And so I think one of the best things is to just put it in their hands, put the technology, all the fancy technology that we use, just put it in the hands of young people and let them see it for themselves and then talk to them and say, what can you do to make a difference? And even if it's just the recycling program are switching the cleaning products and then they see they go back a month later and the sensor reads different now they know they made a difference and mm. they learned something and they'll remember that <laughs> yeah before even like uh, before we bounce over to laura and i'm seeing lots of clap reactions not only on video but in the chat too um and if anyone wants to react by the way with the emojis yes keep yes the clapping the hearts all of it i'm um, also just say before i keep going that um you could still add questions to the q a and we'll get to those uh in a couple minutes but uh yeah laura i'm curious from your perspective uh what just how if there well one um any reactions to what erica said but also if there are other ways that you work to engage students who don't, you know, resonate with this automatically. Yeah. Erica, I so love what you're doing as a fellow science educator. You're just amazing. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I teach the science, but I have this craving to engage with the stories as well. And so um, one thing that's been really meaningful and rewarding on our campus that we started back in 2017 um, was this collaborative campus-wide initiative to really engage more with the arts, the humanities, the storytelling side of, um, of climate communication. Again, sort of recognizing uh, what you said, Matt, that um, the science isn't, you know, effective for everyone. Mm. Um, and so we started this initiative called the Climate Stories Collaborative. And I'll put the link in the chat. Eventually, um, we put a call out for interested faculty. And within a year, we had like 25 people. Um, three years in, we had like 75 or 80 faculty members from like 25 different academic programs. And all of these faculty were um, working with their students in their own classes on assignments that are creative communication of climate stories. 
So each class, each faculty member um, got to decide like, you know, do I want my student to work in this particular creative medium or are, do they get to choose their own creative medium? And, you know, we had hundreds of students create um, climate stories projects in all kinds of different visual art media, performing arts media and, and showcased at the end of the year. Um, the works that the work that students were doing to engage with specific stories of you know how communities around the world are being affected by climate change and how communities around the world are responding with action to climate change. And, and the students were telling um, those stories in paintings and drawings and multimedia sculpture, and um, they wrote and performed plays and poetry and music. Um, it was so powerful for the students and the faculty. It really gave um, you know, colleagues all across campus who um, maybe initially felt like, oh, my discipline isn't you know, obviously or automatically connected to climate change. It gave them uh, an on-ramp to teaching about climate change and, and talking about climate change in their classrooms. And I'll say that students did incredible work. And, and you can see um, images that don't do justice, but give you a sense of the kind of creative climate stories projects that our students at Appalachian State University have been doing. Yeah, and I'll I'll just say because I sort of want to pivot the question just a little bit. One, I just dropped the link to the chat, and Laura just dropped the link in uh, climatestories.appstate.edu. But I I want to also ask because uh, I'm seeing lots of questions also flow in, so I want to make sure we have time for those. Um, and I'm looking at you, Sarah, because I know that you were ready to um, kind of talk about ways of engaging students who just beyond those who already want to show up and are excited by this. So I'm curious about that, but I'm also curious about like advice you have for teachers, um, regardless of their discipline. You know, I, there was a question in the chat here um, from someone who might be, or someone who asks about like, how do you incorporate climate into sports and art classes? And it makes me think about like the multidisciplinary nature of climate, but I'm curious um, not only of just how you engage students who might not gravitate to this um, immediately, but also if there's any advice you have for educators, because um, climate could feel like a really intimidating topic, especially depending on where you are, where then there's a political component at times. And it's just like, you don't want to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing. But um, yeah, I just want to give you this space to, to share, Sarah. Thank you, Matt. I mean, we want to be in the newspaper, but for the right reasons, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So to go back to your previous question, it, that's really a question that I grappled with. I, I work in a very interesting school. Asheville is rapidly gentrifying. I have students who are living in generational poverty, who are experiencing homelessness and food insecurity. And then I have students who go to Paris to see Taylor Swift for spring break. You know, and so it very it's very, I have this huge spectrum of students, and especially with my students who are coming from generational poverty who don't have maybe the, um, the, the middle class support that, you know, um, educators really appreciate <laughs> and because it makes our job easy at home. Um, I, I grappled with this, and it came down to stories. Um, so it's awesome to hear Laura's work. I can't wait to hear more about that work at Appalachian State. And so part of my Fridays for the Future is I have identified lists of climate activists, youth climate activists. And so um, typically a Friday bell ringer, it's an activity that do, students do as soon as they come in the classroom, is to learn about youth climate activists and the work that they're doing, which always gives a why. And my hope is that it's inspiring to them. So they see um, they see teenagers from all walks of life who um, are empowered to affect change in their communities. Uh, and I found that that is a, a really effective way to engage students and to also inspire them because they, they see themselves in those teenagers. Um, my advice for teachers is to first and foremost, take care of yourself. There's a lot of demands on you. Um, we're asked to do everything and to be everything. And so just take care of yourself because if you don't put your ma oxygen mask on first, then you can't help mm. other people, to use that metaphor. Um, 
I have been engaging with an environmental science professor of mine from UNC Asheville, who is a neighbor and now also a friend, Dr. D. Eggers in the environmental science department. And um, for several years now, we have been organizing uh, an invasive removal cleanup, which isn't necessarily directly a drawdown issue, but it is a climate solution um, or a drawdown solution, but it is a climate solution. Um, and so that's a great way for us to get our students outside with our loppers and, you know, whack away at kudzu. There's the, there's the instant gratification, but then there's also just the, the connection because as humans, we thrive on connection, connection with ourselves, connection with uh, nature, connection with each other. And so you don't have to do the work in isolation. Reach out to your peers, find your people, um, and engage with them. And, you know, it'll make a, for a fun afternoon service project. There you go. And so I have, I, I appreciate that so much, Sarah. And I, I, um, I'm just like looking at Steve for reactions to this. Um, and next, I already have like an exciting question for you, Amoy. So we'll get to that. But, um, but yeah, I, Steve, I just want to hear any um, reactions. And I, I think of, you know, the Candida building, I know that lots of different, uh, lots of different subjects teach within the building. So there's already like this ability to learn about, um, about sustainability by just being in this space. But curious for you, especially when it comes to um, I think you've talked a little bit about engaging students, uh, but, you know, any advice for teachers or for educators, um, at, you know, who are trying to figure out how to enter these conversations and bring them, connect them with their students? Well, with, with me, it's a little different. Uh, again, you know, I'm not uh, academically teaching these, these mm -hmm. students. I'm, I'm more like... Uh, uh, someone that they can come to and bounce ideas off of. Uh, but the way that I work with them is I really try to incorporate the students into absolutely everything I do. And I really go out of my way to to try to provide leadership opportunities for them, for, for them to practice those uh, soft skills, uh, whether it be communication, whether it be decision making, whether it be uh, just showing up to, to lead. Uh, and, you know, the, the beauty of, of our Georgia Tech students is they're, they're just also bright. Not that, I mean, I think all students are, are, are bright, don't get me wrong. Uh, but given uh, an opportunity to, to lead, it's amazing what the students can do. And especially, you know, uh, thinking about it in terms of, okay, you've got an organization, but what is the organization gonna look like after you leave? Mm -hmm. So, you know, incorporating the, the planning and incorporating the, uh, the inclusion and in incorporating the, uh, the vision of, of, of what these students want to see and what, what they wanna do. Uh, we provide, or I, I tr try to provide a, a lot of different kinds of opportunities. Uh, you know, if they want to meet somebody, if they want to see something, if they want to uh, try something a little different. Uh, you know, we had a, an opportunity two years ago, three years ago, when we did a cover crop uh, of our rooftop garden, and I let the students decide. And it, it worked great. It was awesome. And, you know, it was something that we were able to point to and say, okay, this was a student driven decision and this is how it worked. Uh, you know, we had recently a huge success here on campus with, uh, with bird strikes uh, in terms mm -hmm. of turning our lights off uh, in our academic buildings at night. And that was 100% driven by students. You know, uh, they, they, I, they identified the problem. You know, they, they came to me, we talked about it a little bit. We, they came up with a strategic plan. They went out and had those communications with building managers and also with, with other uh, folks on staff. And uh, 
they they move the needle because now that's part of our uh, communications uh, plan is, uh, you know, remember to turn your lights off during the uh, uh, spring and fall migration. Mm. So, you know, just incorporating the students and letting them have the room to to express themselves and, and to, you know, honestly, to sometimes to make mistakes. That's okay too, because this is a safe environment. They, they can make those mistakes without, uh, you know, huge, huge consequences, especially if we're doing it collaboratively. You know, you, you all said something earlier and, and it's what I hit on all the time, and that's community, because mm. we're all connected and we're all working, uh, you know, in relationship with each other. And so if I can point to, you know, if we're talking, for instance, about invasive non-native uh, plant removal, and we can talk about birds at the same time, we're, we're making that connection across groups. And so people realize, or our students realize that, well, this is connected, you know, the fact that I'm saving these, this, this environment for these, for these native birds, uh, that, that's biodiversity, that's, uh, you know, beauty in terms of of uh, of, of the color and, and the, uh, you know, I always just say that uh, the, the birds, it's like a, a free show, but uh, it's, you know, the fact that we're all connected and, and that's the beauty of, of, you know, having these, the great variety of things that we have going on on campus. There's always room for everybody. I love that. And I, and I think um, just to, <laughs> to shout out something um, out that I really appreciate from what you mentioned, Steve, like it, you know, even your role reminds me of the importance of collaborators and it's been cool in, in different ways to see all of you collaborate in different ways. Like I think of Laura, for instance, with like app state, like a, a, t a talk that I gave like on the campus where you had so many different departments collaborating to bring people together and like different different uh, different folks bring people together. But I want to shift to Amoy actually with a question uh, based on something that is, that was in the chat and again, shout out to like educators in general, but uh, I'm already seeing <laughs> some of the questions that we've gotten in the chat are already answered. Thanks to some of you like typing responses in. Um, I see Sarah and and uh, Erica with a couple of responses there, but I want to ask um, Amoy, because, you know, in your role, yeah. you know, with experiential learning, I, you know, there, and uh, correct me if I'm uh, wrong in kind of uh, understanding the work that you do, but you know, something that we were asked about in the chat is how to integrate climate education across subjects in yes. a holistic way. And, it, you know, because it doesn't just need yeah. to be the climate focus or earth focus yes. or science classes, but like, I'm curious, like, how do you, um, how, how in your like, eyes do educators go about think, doing that? Yeah. yeah, I think of my role as like experiential learning 2.0, like, yes, take them on a field trip, Mm -hmm. but you have to think about the ecology of the place. So for mm -hmm. example, our students are going to Jekyll Island and questions that we had to ponder is sea level rise is impacting Jekyll, but who lives there? Gullah Geechee mm -hmm. people. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do they eat? What is in their cuisine? So already just thinking about who's peopling the place on this field trip, what's happening environmentally in that space, how do we prepare our students to be there is already just opening up a variety of questions that we have. And so I just think of like, no, I'm not just gonna take my kids somewhere, but who's there, what are we gonna see, what's happening there? And just coming up with a toolkit of questions in whatever you do. Mm, yeah, it's powerful to think about that too, because when I, I'm, I'm just, even with that example that you give, like I'm seeing aspects of sociology or history yes, that history, might overlap yeah. with that, right? And I'm curious if others have thoughts or if you've seen anything really creative when it comes to not just the science and environment folks, but the, you know, math teachers or other disciplines that aren't expected. Amoy, you Can got I examples. shout out this amazing Please, math teacher? 
yeah. just came to me and was like, I am teaching statistics. But what I want to do is to think about the human statistics of this. And so we just like worked on our first unit and she's going to use categorical data to think about how can we get to zero waste in Atlanta. And she's going mm. to use her entire year to build in this math course and we're building it out together. And she's just like, I just want to make this real. Like, I think it was Aubrey in the chat was like, make it real for the kids. Mm. And she's going to use her statistics class to like make it real for the kids. And for years in the DEI space, we're hearing that maybe we should like consider doing this more where we think about numbers, but think about it from a human perspective. And this teacher, Betsy Qualls, came to me and was like, let's co-labor on this together and let's get this done. There we go. Are there, are, I just want to invite anyone else, you know, briefly, because we have, we have so many questions that we've gotten. I want to ask you all to, um, in a bit, uh, you know, for resources that could be helpful for folks, obviously, but uh, any other like really creative examples or examples you might not automatically think of, of like, Ooh, this is how they're bringing in climate. Maybe starting with Sarah, I see you off of mute. And then Laura, it looks like you all said something to add into. Um, we have an amazing art educator here, Christina Shriver, um, and she often uses um, resources that otherwise would go into the landfill to create art projects, like individual projects, but also um, class art projects with an emphasis on uh, climate change's impact on populations, human populations and animal populations. So that's one way that she's keeping materials out of the landfill and also using her art class as a way to increase climate education. Oh, other examples, Laura? Uh, Laura? Yeah, I'd love to shout out a colleague, Carla Ramsdell, who's in the physics and astronomy department at Appalachian State University, who teaches thermodynamics and um, the physics of energy. She has coupled her love of cooking and food with her um, expertise in all things energy. And she has this amazing set of outreach programs in which she's engaging people in short workshops and long deep dive series. and. Um, you know, learning about climate and climate solutions via our love of food and cooking and cooking together. And she's just this extraordinary educator, dynamic speaker, and um, is making a lot of difference with audiences who maybe wouldn't have signed up for a climate workshop, but are coming because of food and cooking is fun, right? She's just really amazing. Oh my gosh, this is, you're all, you're all incredible with everything you have to share. And I'm just I feel like this needs to be like three hours in the future. Um, but Erica, I, I saw you come off of mute. Yeah, I, I wanted to just um, shout out one of my past um, PhD students who, uh, Dr. Bobachi Kinaparam. Um, she's also like Forbes Magazine 30 Under 30 for Energy, but she created this tool called Rehouse and I'm gonna pop it in the chat so everyone can see it. But, you know, just thinking about equity, her tool says, how do we, you know, this is all about like people being healthy, people being sustainable. And she's from Nigeria. And one of the things is we know the people who are being harmed the most, unfortunately, are the people who did not cause some mm -hmm. a lot of the issues of climate change. And so she really, you know, she came to Carnegie Mellon and was like, I want to focus on people in the global south because the global south is suffering from all of the problems of these extreme heat waves that they're getting there's they're have like they're having all the flooding so people are literally dying and just being super sick because of problems that they didn't cause mm -hmm. and so she wanted to do to help but she also recognized that a lot of times um people in the global south it's there's more than one language you can't just put a guidebook or a curriculum in english right mm -hmm. because the the whole world doesn't speak english and so she she thought she made this guidebook, but it has a lot of images and pictures. So it gave people who do self-build also recognizing people don't always just have money to hire an architect and a contractor. If yeah. you're in the global South, a lot of the people there build with their own hands. And so she said, how do I make a practical guidebook for people who are not rich and are building with their own hands to understand sustainability, understand the like practical things they can do? but using a lot of images. And so her whole dissertation was literally to do this 
but to do it with very few words and having images to help people understand how to just be comfortable. And so I'm going to pop that in the chat, but, you know, because I, I see questions about curriculum, like how do we do things? And I just wanted to touch on some of the challenges that people are, our brothers and sisters in the global South are, are facing um, and solutions that can help them. Yeah. You know, one thing I want to, um, you know, kind of pivot to a bit, just looking at our time is, tangible resources that you might all recommend, whether it's like actual resources you'd recommend viewers or the audience here checks out, or even just approaches to find those resources. Because like one question I saw that I thought was interesting, which, you know, I think about a lot or get a lot is like, how do we find stories of youth and others working on climate solutions in communities, which obviously, like in the case of Pittsburgh and you, Erica, and Drawdown's neighborhood there in Atlanta, like, you know, that's something that we really focus on is finding those stories um, and, you know, Googling and connecting with folks who know the communities for some of the best, you know, to find folks who are doing the work. But um, I'm curious from you all just in general, when it comes to this topic of, of, you know, education, are there any resources that you would want to point other educators to or just advice you would have for them on how to figure out where to get started? Because it's very clear people are looking for, you know, the curricula and and um, other things that they could use within their within their work, right? The climate, it's, a, it's clean, it's a clean network. It's the mm. climate literacy and energy, you know, it's education and something network. Um, right. They have a whole lot of resources and you can filter by grade level and content area. Um, so that's a way just to click and, um, you know, find lessons that have been vetted by other educators. Um, and then a local um, activist with the Citizens Climate Lobby reached out to me and shared the Vlog Brothers video um, on how to fix the climate. And from there, Oh, no, I created a nine part climate science, um, a climate policy, um, and then the climate solutions also. Um, but clean is a clean is a great network and I'm happy to share all of my curriculum too. And I keep putting my email in the chat. So reach out to me if you, if you want it and please, please share it once you have it. <laughs> yeah. And I also just dropped in the link for clean, uh, clean or uh, clean it's C L E A N E T dot org is is the site for folks. And yeah, I've heard about of Clean too. Other resources that um you'd put out there are just advice for folks, uh Amoy. I know I love the EPA website and all of their projects because one, it's so accessible, it's so quick and it's so affordable. And when I need to like do a quick project and simulate sea level rise or something like that, they always have like a good bite-sized project with really you know, materials that I can find in my environment. And NASA also has some really good programs mm. and projects. And I like using that because they are just like, use what you have in your space and get this done. So those are my two go-tos when I'm looking for something quick. Laura? Well, of course, Project Drawdown has a lot of amazing resources. So um, everyone on the webinar, please go check those out. But in terms of higher education, one that, that we've tried out across our campus at Appalachian State is a hybrid course developed by the University of California system called Bending the Curve. And um, a group of our faculty who starting in like 2018, we're talking about and researching ways to kind of overcome the challenge of, we wanted to offer an introductory climate solutions course. It was kind of a survey of lots of different climate solutions strategies, but there's no one faculty member who has the expertise to teach all of that. Mm. Um, the bending the curve curriculum helps you get over that obstacle. So the hybrid course involves all of these video modules on climate solutions from like economic policy, carbon tax, for example, to various different ty types of technologies, to social movements, reforestation, et cetera. Um, and we've offered that out of something like um, 18 different academic programs where the faculty members mm -hmm. get to like sort of tailor the in-class conversation towards their own um, discipline. So, you know, from 
the we're, we're about to have some sections taught in the finance, um, banking and insurance department, um, the English department, anthropology, biology, sustainable development, sustainable technology, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies and more. Um, so bending the curve is a really great starting point, a platform for teaching an intro course that's about all of the different climate solution strategies out there. And of course, we've, we've brought in project drawdown materials um, to supplement that as well. So bending the curve. Awesome. Yeah, I love I also love hearing these because I realize there's so many resources I also share with educators too. So I'm going to have to go back and like write all these down. Um, and I'll also just mention for folks before kind of going to other resources that um, we will in about a week be, or in the next week, but I'd say in about a week, um, release uh, a blog post on the Drawdown website along with the recording. And we'll make sure to send that to all of the registrants here. So you have that, including um, a bunch of these links that we've talked through because this is the most link heavy webinar um, <laughs> out there. We're setting records, but yes, Steve. So for me, the, the resource that I use the most are actually the students. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have found that uh, through their travels, through their experiences, they just have so much to offer. And uh when we're slowed down, because that's what really what I do more than anything is, is just slow mm -hmm. people down. Uh, when we're slowed down and we're just putzing around the garden and having these conversations, then people start talking about food and they start talking about where they live and they start talking about their experiences. And to me, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in serendipity. That, that you don't always know where the conversation is going to go. And th the most important thing is just have really interesting people in the room and do, do a lot of active listening. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm very fortunate. We, we have awesome students here, but I, I, we're not the only ones. There are awesome students everywhere. Uh, give them the space, you know, give them the opportunity to, to share their thoughts uh, because you know, they, they spend so much time in the classroom and, and they're so uh, often asked to, to, to repeat or, 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 or share, you know, the, the things that they've learned. And, and I'm kind of looking at it a little differently. I, I, I wanna know what, what you can teach me. What, what are you bringing? What have you seen? Uh, uh, how how uh, are you interpreting what's going on? Uh, mm -hmm. Because we don't all interpret it the same way. We don't all see it the same way. And that kid that might have had an enormous amount of privilege growing up, if they if they hear another student's experience that didn't have all of those advantages yet still managed to, to, to succeed and to make it into a place like Georgia Tech. That's huge, that's huge. Uh, and it's peer to peer. Uh, it, it's not coming from above. It's not uh, uh, even from a book, I mean, but the kids uh, and, and it's in general, all of them are just so bright. Uh, and when they have a chance to use their voice, they they just shine. Mm -hmm. They just shine. Yeah, it's it's powerful. And there are so many other resources that I think we could shout out and all. And so one thing I'll do is follow up with the panelists for any other links and things that we sh we should share in the follow up posts that we put out in about a week. One thing I will say as we wrap up is just could everyone just with the reactions, uh, the reaction emojis, with the chat, just like thank our phenomenal panelists. So generous with their time. Obviously, as we know, educators already do enough, uh, do it all. Um, you're superheroes in your own right, if I haven't said that already. And it's just amazing to hear from your work. And thank you all for what you do. Um, and as we wrap up, I just want to provide the reminder that one other resource that people could check out, of course, is the Drawdown Eco Challenge, which you could find at drawdown.org slash or drawdown.ecochallenge.org. I see I caught myself. 
uh, the so many links, like I said. Uh, but yeah, you could also register for our the third the third webinar in our three part webinar series happening the same time next week focused on business and so again if you want to check out eco challenge i love that there are all the individual actions with various resources um but also again the webinar registration link for next week you could find that at drawdown.ecochallenge.org um and again thanks everyone for for tuning in um if you want to see more conversations like this in the future like drop it in the chat let us know. We take that seriously. It's always great to be in community with epic educators. And uh, yeah, as we wrap up, I just want to again, thank you all for um, being here. And I wish we could have had time to get to more of the questions, but um, this future, we'll have future conversations like this, I'm sure. Um, and thanks again, everyone. Uh, but have a wonderful, wonderful day. And happy Eco Challenge, happy October, uh, happy all the things. Thanks again, everybody.